Welcome to day 296 of our scripture reading and daily encouragement. Today we're going to cover Hosea chapters 5 and 6, and then we're going to begin Revelations by covering Revelation 1. In Hosea chapter 5, God is announcing judgment on the people of Israel. He's announcing judgment on them because they have worshipped other gods along with him. Remember, he's just compared himself to the husband of a prostitute. He had Hosea marry a prostitute, and he is comparing that physical relationship between Hosea and his wife to the relationship between himself, God, and the people of Israel. They have turned to other lovers, it says, other things that they put before God, other gods that they worship along with God, just like this prostitute would be with other men while she was still with her husband. Then in chapter 6, there is a call to repent, to simply turn back to God. Come, let us return to the Lord. So he's acknowledging we've worshipped other gods. We've been a prostitute to God. Now let us just come back to him. That's the beauty as he's waiting for us. It says, if we simply turn back to him, he will heal us. He will restore us. He will bandage our wounds. He will bring us back into his presence. See, this is a plea from Hosea to the people to turn back to God. But it's also a promise for us. It doesn't matter what we've done. It doesn't matter how far we've turned away. If we simply turn back to him and turn away from those things that lead us away from him, he will restore us. He will heal us. He will bandage our wounds. He'll bring us back into his presence. That's a promise for us. It was a promise for these people. They chose to ignore it, and we know that. But it's a promise for us and our challenges. We don't want to ignore it and have the, the destruction like the Israelites had. We have this whole story that we've gone over and over and over as a warning for us. Hosea says, oh, that we might know the Lord. Let us press on to know him. Oh, that we might know the Lord. Let us press on to know him. In chapter 6, we get the heart of God toward each of us. It says, I want you to show love to me, not offer sacrifices. See, in their time, they were trained to offer these sacrifices. And God is saying, I just want you to show me love. I'm not worried about your sacrifices. I want your love. I want you to know me, not your burnt offerings. God just wants us to love him, to pursue knowing him. And that's what we've done through the scripture reading. And I know you're on this journey with me, but that's what we're doing. We're, we're pursuing knowing more about him. And he loves that and he's very pleased with what you're doing. But see, these people, they were more interested in doing wickedness. They were more interested in worshiping other gods than pursuing loving him and getting to know him. And I think that we can often look at this as believers and say, Way, wow, I'm glad we're not like that. I'm glad we're not pursuing other gods. I'm glad I don't have any wooden carved statues in my house that I worship along with God. But as I mentioned yesterday, many of us do put other things before God, so we don't need to be lulled into thinking we're not in the same boat as these Israelites. You know, I was watching a video yesterday that a friend shared with me, and I'll probably share this, this video on Facebook at some point soon, but it's the reality that we put many idols before God and we don't even realize it. This video doesn't focus on anything outside of entertainment. It doesn't focus on our career, sports, hobbies, things that we talked about yesterday. It just focuses on the fact that the average American spends six hours a day in front of a TV or computer screen, or a screen of some sort, watching movies, videos, TV shows, TikTok, whatever, getting totally desensitized how much time we spend looking at things that aren't God. We're vegging our minds out for entertainment. We're numbing our minds. And that's what Satan has trained our society to do. We have technology that helps us get there. See, it's easy to look at an alcoholic or a drug addict and realize, hey, yeah, they're going to that substance. They're going to that chemical to numb away some deep pain. But how many people consider themselves above those addicts while we're just a lesser, using a lesser form of a drug to numb out. And that drug would be called entertainment. So guys, we need this reminder as much today as the Israelites needed it 2,500 plus years ago. We often split our time between God and other things. Whether it's entertainment or some other form of pleasure. 
things that take our time away from God. And it's time to evaluate where we are. And just like the video said, it's God doesn't want us to not have a good time. We can have a good time doing entertainment things. It's about putting those things before God. We need to make sure that we're turning back to God, always turning back to God as we accidentally, or maybe it's on purpose, I don't know, as we accidentally turn away from God, we need to be constantly evaluating, turning back. How can I turn back to God today? How can I repent today? It should be a daily, hourly moment. Every moment we should be thinking about how to turn back to Him. That's showing Him love, devotion, and getting to know Him better. And we need to make sure that we're not allowing other things to share the time that God should have alone. See, if you pursue scripture like you are, if you read it, if you, can, if you pursue praying more, that's an area of my life I'm trying to get better at. I pray throughout the day, but I want to, take, I want to make dedicated times. You know, back in this time, they would, they would take three times a day to kneel and pray to God. So maybe it's praying more. Maybe it's praise and worshiping with music more in your car or at home. My point is, if we spend time doing these things, pursuing scripture, praying more, praise and worshiping more, you're simply doing what God asked in Hosea 6. These are simple things that we can do to show that we're pursuing him, that we love him. These are things that will help us get to know him more. I can listen to worship music, and often it's it's those songs are built around scripture and it helps me get to know God. It reminds me and I'm singing and praising to him, but it's reminding me and it's teaching me things about him. Obviously, reading scripture, every time I read scripture, I'm learning things I didn't see before, and I'm getting to know him on a more deep, intimate level. All he's asking for, guys, is that we simply make an effort to give him more and more of our time. I love this message that we're getting from Hosea. Now, we're going to transition over into the New Testament, and we're going to start the final book of the Bible, Revelation. Now, let's be honest, this book can be very intimidating to read. It can certainly be intimidating to teach. I've often been too intimidated to even touch Revelations. But we're going to approach it from the standpoint of what we can break down day to day that helps each of us. See, the more and more I've studied Revelation, the more and more I've listened to other scholars that I trust that dig into Revelation, the more I've realized There's really nothing new in Revelation that hasn't already been told throughout the Bible. And I'm going to try to point that out to you as we go through Revelation. We tend to shy away from teaching or even wanting to read this book. We don't understand it, right? We can't possibly understand what John is showing us. And our enemy has convinced us that it's an intimidating book that we can never understand. And I'm by no means claiming to be an expert But I'm excited to begin breaking down this book. We're going to try to break it down into simple teaching and encouragement that we can understand. As we jump into chapter 1, we get the foundation for this book. It says, Jesus sends an angel to present revelations to his servant, John. John, who would faithfully report everything he saw. It says, God blesses the one who reads the words of this prophecy to the church. And he blesses all who listen to its message and obey what it says. No wonder the enemy wants us all freaked out and worried about Revelation and thinking we can't understand it or thinking we can't read it or thinking that we can't teach it. Because it tells us in chapter 1 right at the beginning that we are blessed if we teach it. We are blessed if we listen to it and obey it. Think about that. No wonder Satan wants to make you think it's too complicated. So let's just start there. You're going to be blessed, and I'm going to be blessed by simply going through this. Now, let's break down the word revelation and what it means. First one starts with, this is a revelation. Jesus sent an angel to present this revelation to John. The Greek word used here is apokalupsis. Maybe where we get the word apocalypse, apocalypsis. It means, see, we think of apocalypse as destruction and all this, but apocalypsis, the word used here for revelation, means a disclosure of the truth. Think about that. It's a disclosure, a revealing of the truth of instruction concerning things before unknown. 
So it's allowing us to get to know things we wouldn't normally know. It says it's also described as a manifestation of the truth. The truth is coming out. But here's a key piece, and I'm going to be careful. We don't want to go weird here, but it also can mean to lay bare, making naked. So apocalypsis means disclosing this truth, revealing truth that we haven't known before, giving us instructions and making naked, laying bare. And I want to put this into layman's terms. This is an exposing of God's instructions, an exposing of his truth for us to know. Have you ever heard the term opening the kimono? That's a term that we use sometimes in everyday life. And it means that someone's going to show you something they would otherwise keep hidden. Remember the term, term apocalypsis means to lay bare making naked. Obviously, we don't run around making ourselves bare and showing our most private parts to people, right? That would be weird. It would go against what God normally asks, and you'd be arrested, right? But we use the term to indicate that we're giving someone information that exposes our hidden secrets. If a business were to say, I'm going to open the kimono and show you you know, our profit statements, you're exposing the hidden secrets that they normally wouldn't publish out to the public. And that's what's happening here. This is not some weird thing of making bare or naked. This is God is saying, I'm going to expose things that haven't been exposed. I'm going to expose things to you, my innermost secrets, the truth, and I'm going to give it to you. This should be exciting to us. God's opening the kimono to us. And if you've heard that term, you understand this is exciting. This means we get to hear the innermost secrets. I can't emphasize that enough. And it says Jesus is delivering his message to John through an angel, exposing some precious data, some precious information that we otherwise would not know. It's sort of like John is giving, I mean, Jesus is giving John the secrets. I'm going to say that again because I said it wrong. It's sort of like Jesus is giving John the secrets. And then John turns around and shares them with us. This should be exciting to know that we're about to learn of the secrets that God has stored up to share with us in this book. Don't be intimidated by this book. Be excited about what we're going to get to learn and that you're going to be blessed. Remember, if you read this, we get a blessing. We learn God's secrets. That's why the enemy works so hard to convince us that we can't possibly understand it or that we're going to misinterpret it. The enemy doesn't want us to think that we can learn God's secrets, and he certainly doesn't want us to be blessed now, John tells us that he is writing this to the original seven churches in the province of Asia. And those, church are list, those churches are listed out. I'm not going to go through the names today. But back in this time, we have to understand they didn't have a church on every street corner like many of our towns have today. You can drive five miles through Blount County and see 30 churches. That's not what they had in that day. They had one main church, so to speak, per region. So if you had a city of Maryville, there would have been a church of Maryville, maybe a church of Alcoa, maybe a church of Lenore City, maybe a church of Knoxville. See, they have one main church, so to speak, per region, and then the believers spent time in their homes and met together in their homes to have the smaller pockets of churches. So John is writing this to the seven major churches. He says, grace and peace to you from the one who is, who always was, and who is still to come. See, I love that reminder. He's saying grace and peace from Jesus, the one who is. He is today. He always was. He was in the past, and he is still to come. He always will be in the future. And then he says, also, this is from the sevenfold Holy Spirit and from Jesus the Messiah. So if you've never had it explained to you before, the Holy Spirit is defined in Scripture as a sevenfold spirit. First of all, it is the Spirit of the Lord. It's the Spirit of God. That's number one. Number two, it's the Spirit of wisdom. It gives us wisdom. Number three, it's the Spirit of understanding. It gives us understanding. Number four, it's the wisdom. It's the, I'm sorry, it's the Spirit of counsel. It's this, number five, it's the Spirit of might, power. Number six, it's the spirit of knowledge. And number seven, it's the sphere, the spirit of the fear of the Lord. So it's the spirit of God, just in general. It's the spirit of wisdom, understanding, counsel, might, knowledge, and the spirit of the fear of the Lord. That's the sevenfold spirit defined in Scripture. 
John says, Jesus is the faithful witness to all the things I'm about to tell you. Jesus is the Alpha, and Jesus says himself, I'm the Alpha and the Omega. I'm the beginning and the end. I'm the one who is, who always was, and who is still to come, the Almighty One. So Jesus, we're establishing his, his greatness, his presence there. John is establishing the importance of Jesus, reminding us that Jesus shed his blood for all who believe in him, and setting up the stage for why this is important to listen to the words of Jesus He's always been with God. He always will be. We need to listen to his words, John is saying. So after John proclaims the majesty of Jesus, the majesty of the Holy Spirit, John says, I'm, a, I'm just a servant. I'm exiled to the island of Patmos for preaching the word of God about Jesus. I'm nothing. I'm revealing to you what I've seen from Jesus. Now, John, it says John was worshiping God on the Sabbath. So he's worshiping God there by himself. So he understood what Hosea was talking about. He's worshiping God. He's getting to know God. He's showing his love and devotion to God. And he hears a loud voice behind him. When he turned around, he sees something magnificent. He sees Jesus. Jesus is holding seven lampstands in one hand. That represents the seven churches. And he's holding seven stars in the other hand. That represents an angel for each of the churches. Each church had an angel assigned to it. Jesus was wearing a long robe with a gold sash across his chest. His head and hair were white, like wool, white as snow, pure. His eyes like flames of fire, his feet like polished bronze. He had a thundering voice. He had a sharp two-edged sword coming out of his mouth. And scripture has told us that the word of God is a sharp two-edged sword. And that's coming out of Jesus' mouth. And it says his face was like the sun in all of its brilliance. What a vision John saw. What a vision he, sh he saw and he shared it with us. See, we can read this. We can close our eyes. We can go back to Revelations 1. I went through it quickly, but you can go back there and you can read that. You can close your eyes and you can imagine this majestic presence of Jesus. John gave us this great detail so that we can imagine what he looks like. Jesus said, don't be afraid, John. I was dead, but I'm alive and I will be forever. I hold the keys of death in the grave. Some versions would say, I hold the keys to death in Hades. See, these keys that belong to the devil, I took them back. I'm Jesus. I took them back. I won the battle. See, we shouldn't be scared of death. Jesus owns the keys. And he offers us life forever with him. We should not be scared of death here on earth because that's the beginning of eternal life with him. As we get into chapter 2 tomorrow, Jesus will give John specific information to the seven major churches. And these will be things that we need to pay attention to. It's things that Jesus likes and things he doesn't like. But today, let's make sure that we're learning from Hosea and we're making every effort to give our time and devotion to God. To know him more. To love him more. And be encouraged that you're about to be blessed by going through God's book of secrets and revelation. I hope you're encouraged today, and I hope you have a great day.